And now, Christian Connections, welcome to the studios of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. A great, exciting program today. Uh, you've already recognized our special presenter, uh, Pastor Miguel Mendez uh, from Loma Linda University Church. And uh, he's going to talk about, uh, well, shooting the messenger. Uh, he'll tell us about that in just a few minutes. Of course, Dr. David Taylor wouldn't miss the Christian connection tonight just because of Pastor Miguel. That's right. So, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm glad to see him here. Uh, all of us all are. Of us. All of us are. And uh, on this side, uh, everybody knows Sheila, Sheila Hodgkin. And, of course, Adam Hanna uh, completes the team uh, that's going to really thrill you tonight. And uh, we're going to do that by uh, great music as well. Uh, in fact, uh, tell me about our uh, singer. Well, I'm really excited to listen and hear um, Ezrika Bennett. Um, she's going to be singing, and Christian Penango will be accompanying her on the guitar. And Miguel knows them very well, and I, I'm, I'm really excited. They're, they're part of um, the Loma Linda University Church, and they... They sing a lot over there, and I'm glad they're sharing their vocal and musical talents with us here on LLBN. Mm -hmm. And they will be singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. Thou forever will be Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness Morning by morning New mercies I see Great is the 
<laughs> Amen. <laughs> As Rika. And Christian. Get it. Mm -hmm. Christian with the guitar. Guitar, that's right. You know, I love this uh, about that song, that music. Her voice is so soothing. Mm -hmm. And just powerful and, and deep, yeah. you know, robust. Robust. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. yes. Beautiful. I really like it when we have, you know, live accompanying me and, mm -hmm. uh, with, with these artists. It mm -hmm. just really feels good. Of course, the other stuff sounds good too, so. <laughs> Uh, but it's nice to have the variety that we have. And that's a, really a, been a blessing here at the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. And the variety of pres presenters is abundant, too, here. Uh, that's a pretty good advantage, uh, isn't it, Dr. Taylor? Oh, a mighty good advantage. Yeah. I was late coming. I was mm -hmm. so involved with Luke's mm -hmm. picture. Luke mm -hmm. Excellent. It really takes me mm. And the song that the young lady just sang was not music. Music, that's notes. Songs, the lyrics. Mm. That's the difference. Amen. My culture was not illiterate, but non-literate. They sang. Mm. You listen to their songs. Mm. And it's about their journey. That song was about a journey. Yes. And we look at the journey tonight, I think. That's, that's part of the journey. Mm. Yes. What do you know about Pastor uh, Miguel? I know this, that I love him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love to hear him speak. He challenges, and yet he warms the heart. Not stealing from John Wesley, my heart is always strangely warm. <laughs> well, let's give him that opportunity right now. Uh, are you ready, Pastor? Always ready, Marlon, always ready. Take the stand. <laughs> Perhaps the time has come where you have returned to the place that saw you grow up, in that place that held all these dreams, aspirations, and you've left, you've left that small town, and then you return, and you return typically because the hometown boy or the country girl has done well. That's kind of what is happening in the passage that we have selected today, as Luke takes us into, journey, into this journey, this journey that has seen Jesus go from being affirmed in his ministry at the banks of the Jordan, to being driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, to defeat Satan by quoting scripture, and now, now Jesus, after spending some time walking the highways and byways of Galilee, is back home. Now, I know a little bit about going back home. I went to a boarding school in a small Adventist secondary educational school, and it was a rough period of becoming adapted to this new reality, these new rhythms of life living and breathing in an environment that was created by Sister White. We would wake up at 5 o'clock every morning and prepare ourselves for worship. After that, we would go to breakfast and then we would go to work. Each one of us had different tasks, different things to do. And after work, we would come back to our dormitories, shower, change, go to school. After that, we would eat and then lunch again, work. And after that, dinner, vespers, and to bed. I never really was able to move in and with those rhythms. And so by the end of my last year of high school education in this institution, I was greeted by the sad realization that I was not going to graduate. This was heartbreaking. And so as I thought about words and language to share with my mom and my dad, the reality of me having to stay another year in this place, I prayed. Now, I wasn't much into church back then, but I prayed. I prayed that God would bestow some mercy upon me. 
For some reason, the dean wanted to see me. And so as we chatted together and he told me about my grades and my failures, I said, well, if I don't graduate, you know I have to stay here one more year. Friends, he gave me my diploma right then and there. And I was able to leave with a bit of humility and some unspoken and unsaid things. I've often been invited to go back, to go back to that school and share maybe a week of prayer, maybe some messages, maybe some advice. But the reality is I'm always hesitant. If I'm being completely honest with you, I've never actually accepted an invitation to go back. You see, these people know my past. They know me in ways that my colleagues and my church and the people in this community don't know me. And so I always wonder if in their eyes I can be more than the sum of my youthful indiscretions and mistakes. Perhaps this is the spirit that has grabbed that congregation as they hear Joseph's boy deliver a homily. If you have a Bible, I'll invite you to turn with it to Luke, the fourth chapter. And we're going to be looking primarily at this story that begins in verse 16. Luke has Jesus returning to Galilee, the, to Nazareth, the place where he has been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he goes to the synagogue. Now, it's interesting that synagogue services always were created around the message, around the reading of the Torah. And so as Jesus unscrolls the words, hang thick and heavy in the air. He is quoting, after all, from, pro from the prophet Isaiah, that long and oft forgotten passage that talks about the messianic rule. The people know the words well. They've heard Isaiah 61 time and time again. It has become part of their mantra, their prayer. And Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And a hush falls upon that synagogue. You see, in synagogue services, the reading of Scripture was then followed by the preacher sitting down and exegeting or explaining the passage that he had chosen to read. The reason why sermons were given as the preacher sat down was because in synagogue services, the Jews wanted to make it very clear that nothing stood above the Word of God. But here, here you have the word become flesh. Here you have God become man delivering this message, this messianic promise to a group of people that desperately needs some good news. Nazareth, after all. Nazareth is but a blip on the radar. You know, Nazareth is not... The glitz and glamour of Jerusalem, it's not the highbrow theology that was debated in the temple, Nazareth. Nazareth was where sharecroppers lived. Nazareth was where at the intersection of the Gentile world and the Jewish world, you have people desperately seeking identity, desperately seeking some affirmation. You know, scholars will tell you that about 90% of the land in Judea was owned by a small group of families in Jerusalem. People in Galilee particularly, these people hearing this message have spent their lives working other people's land. Inhabiting other people's dreams, making wealth for other people's pockets. These people know 
what it is to be hopeless. And that is why I find it so powerful that Jesus decides to quote from Isaiah's messianic promise of the Jubilee. That 50th year when all debts would be canceled. That year where everything will be reset. That year where the land will be, would be sent back to the original landowners. That year that was included in Israel's liturgical calendar as the ultimate expression of hope. And in this synagogue, you not only have the word made flesh, but you have hope made human. Jesus. Jesus, the apex of expectation. Jesus. Jesus, the one that was sent to proclaim freedom. And so I assume... I assume that people now are waiting, sitting around, huddled there with breathless anticipation, waiting to see how Jesus will interpret this passage. Every eye is following him as the words continue to ring in the air. I have come to proclaim the year of Jubilee. And a calm begins to wash over the congregation, as they realize that this hometown boy has done well. So he sits. He sits to deliver his homily, and his homily is rather short. His exposition of the messianic promise in Isaiah is but one sentence. Today, 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 this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And with that, Jesus grows silent. And you can almost hear the heartbeat beginning to accelerate in that congregation. They know what this means. Oh, is it possible? Could it be? Could it be that finally our debts will be forgiven? Could it be that our land will be returned to us? Could it be that the yoke that has been pressed upon us by Rome and then pressed upon us again by our own country people, could it be that this is the start of something new? And they puff up. And excitement begins to fill their minds as they speak and they say with amazement, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the carpenter? Now often, interpreters that look at this particular passage look at that question and think that what the people in that congregation are actually asking is, well, is it? He can't be the Messiah, can he? But actually, what the question that they're asking is a bit deeper. It's more existential than simply, is Jesus really the Messiah? Rather, the question that they are asking is, can this man deliver this, the, the goods? Because we are so desperate to believe in something. Can he actually come through for us? Scholars will also tell you that in spite of all the conversations that the Jews had about the year of Jubilee and the machinations of a liturgical calendar that would switch itself around to renew and restore hope, Jubilee remained a dream. It remained something ethereal, something that hadn't happened. And so I'm assuming that these people, desperate for something to believe in, say, well, give us proof. We need proof. We speak a lot about faith in our own congregations. But the reality is that faith is often an evidence-driven enterprise. I mean, you desperately desire to believe. Whether you're looking at your child as your child embarks on a life in a future, or you are standing at the grave of your parent remembering, remembering a life will live, the truth of the matter is we all want evidence. 
We're desperate to find evidence. We seek it in every sermon we hear, in every song we sing, in every study we engage in. Isn't this Jesus' son? Show us the evidence. And Jesus, almost as if he is reading the, their mind, understands that deep desire for affirmation and confirmation that is as human as breathing. He says, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. Why do they want to see miracles? Oh, will they want to see miracles and magic that they may believe? They want to see miracles and magic to believe that this Messiah, this Messiah can actually enact Jubilee. It's the same miracles and magic that the congregation demands from the embodiment of bread made flesh when they ask, feed us again, Jesus. It's the same magic that the crowd desires to see as they, as they cry out to him as he hangs in a cross. Why don't you come down, Jesus, and we'll believe. We like evidence. And Jesus will provide evidence. Jesus will provide affirmation and confirmation. The problem is that the message of the gospel the confirmation and affirmation for those that desire a faith-based evidence-lived life is a message that's offensive. It's a message that often would invite us to shoot the messenger. What does Jesus say? Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And then he begins to recount these stories. He tells them some stories, two to be exact. Two of Israel's rich archive of prophetic history. Talks about a widow. A widow that is given oil and flour in the midst of a desperate famine. And he talks about a Syrian captain that is given healing even as his nation goes to war against the people of God. And they hear these stories and their amazement turns to anger. What is it about the gospel that is so offensive? What is it about this Jesus that constantly pushes us to try and shoot the messenger. Well, in the last little bit of time that we have here, I'd like to propose two primary things. Two primary things that result offensive about the gospel. And the first one is that the gospel is prophetic. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Pastor, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I know all about prophetic language. But if we take Jesus' words seriously in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 4, we will realize that the work of the prophet is not in Jerusalem or Israel. That the, that the prophet is called in both these cases to work beyond the confines of Judea. So I think that the first thing that is truly offensive about the gospel is that its prophetic messages call us to, to make our place of work, the arena for our action in the world out there. The problem is that the world out there, my dear friend, is offensive. The problem is that the world out there causes discomfort. The problem that with the world out there is that it is very easy to create walls, whether real or imagined, and to say, these barriers separate us from the other. 
And Jesus says, the work of the prophet is not inside the walls of Jerusalem or the borders of Judea. The work of the prophet is out in the world. So Adventism claims to be a prophetic message. I ask you today, how well are we fulfilling this call? This call to work in the walls that lie beyond our communities. The second thing, the second thing is a bit more nuanced. I want you to read and reflect with me on Luke's recounting the story in verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. I always find that astounding. How easy it is to switch when we're hearing the gospel from adoration to offense, from worship to anger. And they took him and they drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. The gospel is offensive because of who it includes. The problem is we've, all, we've gotten it wrong. We've often thought that the purpose of the gospel is exclusion. But this message, this message that causes us to feel discomfort, this message that would push a worshipful congregation that has heard a message of hope that they needed to hear, this message that causes them to shoot the messenger is because of who it includes. So I would ask you again, if you believe that Adventism as a prophetic movement has a responsibility to work outside of the confines of the walls that we created, then how well are we building communities that can affirm and include those people that will come as a result of our prophetic efforts? The great New Testament scholar N.T. Wright talking about how radical Jesus' statement in Luke 4 is likens it to a sermon being preached at the height of World War II where the preacher takes his Bible and thundering from the pulpit begins to say, in this moment the gospel calls for the redemption of Hitler. I quiver and quake at the response that message would have gotten from the congregation. But if right is right, if N.T. really has understood what Luke is trying to say, then the question I think that we need to ask ourselves in this, the year of our Lord 2023, is are we creating communities that will accept those whom our prophetic movement will bring in? Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4 begins by Jesus being led into the wilderness. And it concludes with Jesus walking away to continue his ministry. And I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating that G that Jesus is tempted to throw himself down from the heights of the temple in order to prove that God is with him. And at the end of this story, you'll have a crowd attempting to throw Jesus down a hill because God is with him. But isn't it fascinating that in both those cases, Jesus knows what his mission is. So please don't shoot the messenger, but I have to ask, are we as missionally clear as Christ was? 
Please pray with me. We hear who you include, and God, it makes us deeply uncomfortable. Because we are much more well versed in the grammar of exclusion. We hear the gospel and we appropriate it, domesticate it, make it our own. But the truth is that your gospel is offensive because it pushes us out of the walls that we build to keep us safe. So allow us, Lord, to go out, to go out with a prophetic message and to prepare communities that will be welcoming and affirming. We pray in your name. Amen. Pastor Miguel Mendez from Loma Linda University Church here on the campus of uh, Loma Linda University. And uh, thank you for... It's always fun. Always fun to share with this, you. Well, the, it's you're, always a blessing. You bring out perspectives that mm -hmm. uh, I've never thought of. I mean, Sheila, I never thought of the Gospels being offensive. No. <laughs> and, you know. And it's, uh, I think it's offensive to, you know, us, maybe. You know, I, I Oh, that's the that message. Out. I yeah. mean, we, we are guilty of that. We're guilty of it because we're not accepting where God loves everyone mm -hmm. and um you know when he talks about the hypocrites or the pharisees you know we might be surprised we're, we're probably the pharisees <laughs> you know making those judgments so it really is eye-opening mm -hmm. you know so again and what uh what, what do you think of what he was talking about <laughs> well i mean i wish i can uh, mm -hmm requote word for word what he said throughout his entire sermon because mm -hmm. the whole sermon was very effective but the gospel it's definitely offensive to those who reject Christ and not interested mm -hmm. in him um, putting themselves above mm -hmm. everything else but it is a welcoming news for the believers who truly and genuinely accept it for the way it is for what it is uh, I, I thought there was a lot of great points you made in your sermon that hopefully we can talk about throughout, throughout the day. Uh, uh, um, there's nothing, nothing like the blessing and the glory of God and, and the Holy Spirit dwelling in the hearts of the believers. Because well, the believers, they know we're living a life of peace and hope. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the other side of the world, living in a life of conflict, fear, uh, anxiety, and the list can just go on. So we are blessed and we're chosen as believers to have the gospel presented to us and, and God giving us the steps to learn and to grow with it. Mm. I, think t I think of the verse, you know, it says uh, people only want to listen to what their itching ears want to hear, mm, yeah. you know. And so uh, I think that's probably what I think was offensive because um, when Jesus is saying love other people or the Sabbath was made for man, you know, um, and it's just, it's everything that Jesus spoke was, was loving and accepting. And uh, for those who had their theories Oh, they knew the Bible as well, the right. Pharisees. You know, it was not, this is not right, you know, so. Well, the problem sometimes is when we put ourselves in a mold or in a box, then it's hard for us to accept and learn beyond mm -hmm. the, the walls that were within that we create for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's good to be open-minded, open-hearted, and listen, and learn and grow, and don't reject the information because you didn't think of it that way before doesn't mean it's wrong yeah that's why the holy spirit has to come into play right dr mm -hmm. taylor what you, I, I know you're thinking I know something yeah, <laughs> taking on it it was just very interesting from the start because luke you'll notice puts lots of emphasis on the woman and the child mm -hmm. today 
we don't put much emphasis on that, especially mm. the woman when it comes to gifts. Mm. Mm. And the child. Mm. And we see Jesus growing up. Is he a good pediatrician? Did he deal in OBGYN, you know? <laughs> Jesus, the woman, the child. And we see this childhood, this development. And it shows us in Luke, and we made it very clear, that it focuses on the world family. That includes all of us, the cultures. You've heard me say it often, that cultures are different, not necessarily better. Mm. That's why I said after our music tonight, now that was not music. That was the song, because mm -hmm. in the song, there's the message. And we add baptisms at our churches. We say, wade in the water. Mm. But my culture, wade in the water, meant get in the stream so the dogs don't catch your scent and you can get away to go north. You know, wade in the water, get away. That was the message that they had. Mm. And they don't have five, six, and seven verses to a song. You hear it repeated often, amazing grace. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's just amazing grace. All the other theology, you know, mm. that comes with presuppositions. Here's what I was taught. This is it. And that's what happened when Jesus spoke to the group. They were upset. They had presuppositions. Mm. Well, thank you for updating the history on Wade in the Water. It's one of my favorite songs. Um, but it's still a story of escaping bondage. That's right, right. bondage. That's the story of Jesus Christ. That's you know, right. He is our escape from bondage. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Taylor, the heart of the matter is that the Bible tells us that we are not at war with flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Right? It is a war, Pastor Miguel. And I saw your Bible open. I like that. I like to see that. Is there anything you'd like to share with us? As as. Dr. Taylor was talking uh, about Luke's, and I think that's spot on. In Luke's narrative, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on women and children. To think that the gospel itself, right, the, the news of the risen Jesus in Luke 24 mm -hmm. was shared by a group of women. In first century Judo Jewish culture, there's nothing more offensive than that a woman's testimony wasn't accepted in, in a Jewish court. And yet Jesus chooses to bestow the most important news of it all to, to a group of women. And it's, I think it's because the whole point of Jesus is to push you out of your comfort zone. If your comfort zone was the place that Christ would have you live in, then... Christ doesn't come and live in a manger and die the death of a criminal and resurrect and share with women and forge a religion of slaves. It, it would have happened differently. And so it's almost this constant battle, not just against principalities and powers, but as Dr. Taylor was saying, against our presuppositions of who God is. If I may throw something on what you just said, it was also given to those who were seeking Jesus again, mm -hmm. who went out in action looking mm -hmm. for Jesus. So Jesus awarded those who came seeking mm -hmm. him, which, which is a lesson in life for us. Mm -hmm. We need to seek so it can be given to us. Yeah, that yeah, well stated. Yeah. Yeah, so often we talk about Jesus being the second Adam. We mustn't forget at creation, Adam was innocent. Jesus, incarnation, holy. Mm. There's a difference. And that difference is to the world because most of Jesus' ministry was spent on the eastern side of Jordan among Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And Luke is the only book in the New Testament written by Gentile. Mm. I wouldn't dare ask Sheila for a drink of water. You know, man, woman, 
a Gentile giving me water to drink, what they touched was unclean. No, mm. it was different. And Jesus began to live that. And that yeah. really made a difference. Really because that represents bondage and Jesus was freedom. Freedom, mm. you know. And I think they were looking, f their, their preconceptions that you're talking about, they had, you're thinking, oh, he's, it's a physical mm -hmm. kingdom. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, not thinking it's a, the spiritual God was going to their hearts for the eternal kingdom that we need to be looking at too. Well, and Pastor McGill covered in his sermon. Mm -hmm. They were looking for magic. Mm -hmm. But Jesus gave them the evidence. I think the word, the word, the word that it. So um, Jesus gave them the real thing. He didn't come to put a show. He didn't come in to put entertainment. He didn't come in just to uh, be a famous man. He just came in to share the good news, the gospel, to present the truth. And, and I, to some, the truth resonated. It captivated them to Jesus, and they followed him. But many rejected the truth, because the truth is not what they were looking for. Mm. Because the truth resists this desire that we have to monopolize it. So we have this, this tribe, this group, this collection of people, we have the truth. And I think what's beautiful about Luke is Luke says, yes, I understand that you have a rich culture, but in the end, mm -hmm. we're not as different as you may think. So Matthew, Matthew is a very Jewish book. It's true. And Matthew begins with a genealogy. For Luke, that genealogy doesn't come into play until, his, until the third chapter. And it's interesting because in Matthew's genealogy, uh, we go all the way back to Abraham. And the implication that Matthew's trying to make is clear, right? Jesus is the culmination of all the promises to the Jewish people. And then Luke comes in and says, ah, but Jesus is much more than that. And so his genealogy goes back to Adam. And the inherent in that message is whether, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, we're not that different. And I wonder if we in our, in our own faith walk could be more effective if we started by noticing the similarities rather than by pointing out all the differences. Mm. Well said. Mm. Mm -hmm. The coming Boy. out. Boy. That's the perfect uh, end to the segment. And to move on to some, how about uh, music ministry? Are you ready for that? Yes. We're going to continue the conversation with uh, Pastor Miguel, and Dr. Taylor, and Sheila Hodgkin, and Deanna, uh, right after you introduce the music, and she favors us with that song. What's up? Yes, we get to hear again from Ezrika and Christian, and they will be singing, she will be singing, um, This Is My Father's World. Mm. Grass. 
as I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler, yeah. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. Is Rika Benna, Dad? Yes. With Christian? With Christian. Christian Penango. Is that how you pronounce it? Mm. It's really nice to uh, hear... Uh, old-time favorites i mean yes that's part of the history of uh, old-time religion old-time religion I, I love that last line god reigns so let us be glad mm -hmm. you yeah. know and uh you know it reminded me of this text in um, romans 8 22 it says for we know that all creation has been groaning as mm. in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised mm. us. That's an amazing passage. Mm -hmm. I like the part about the groaning earth. I mean, back in his time, it's groaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there was... a. Uh, the effects of climate change on, <laughs> on his world. Yeah. Get him. Yes, sir. Your observation. Uh, you know, I thank God for the light that he's given us, the gospel that he shared with us, the good news, because, you know, the stock market goes up and it goes down. Governments around the world collapses and new governments comes along. Shootings and parties are divided against each other. Uh, in spite of all the horrible things that keeps happening in the world, we are in God's world. Mm -hmm. We are protected here. Our souls are in comfort. Mm -hmm. We're in hope. So I thank God for all the ministers like Dr. Taylor, Dr. Miguel, and all those, the dozens and dozens, comes in to this ministry offering the good news of the gospel to the world. No matter how much we study, no matter how much we are in faith, we need to hear, we need to hear the words of God over and over to sustain us. And I, 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 I'm just grateful to all these ministers and the talents and the musicians mm -hmm. to help us share the light that Jesus has given us into the world, help others like, like us mm -hmm. to maybe come out of the darkness and live in hope mm. and, and, and their lives changes forever. They have their impact, their influence on others around them to bring them into God's kingdom and a chain of reactions that just keeps happening worldwide. And, and not just thanks to LLBN, thanks to all media ministries who are out there doing the work because there's more needed. There's not enough of that happening to reach the whole world. The six point billion, 6.2 billion population, they say it's closer to 7 billion now. Uh, how can you reach 
so many with the good words of Jesus. And last, all believers, all believers stick together. Not to, again, not to sit in a, and, and put themselves in a box, but go out and share the good news of Jesus into the world and support the ministries that are able to preach the gospel while we still can. Mm -hmm. While we still can. Because we are living in interesting times like I've never seen in my lifetime. And the way it's impacting even media, completely different from any way I've ever seen it before. And the freedom of our faith may not be there, or freedom to express our faith one day, mm. whether this generation or 10 generations from now. And my point is we should treasure every opportunity, support our local churches, our pastors, ministries like LLBN. Let's share the good news in the world. Marlon, without the good news, what do we have? Well, we have hopelessness. Mm. You know, we have no future. And, you know, this, all this conversation has reminded me of a story because, you know, we've got to do our part in trying to reach the people that find the message offensive. I mean, if we think the, of the story of uh, Saul who became the apostle Paul, he was one of those guys, mm -hmm. right? And he was joined to a group of these people uh, that were going around and eliminating the good news uh, spreaders. Uh, how do we apply that to, to today, Pastor? I think, I think Ganem and started kind of giving some really practical ways. Indeed. In which, in which you can do this. One of the things that I, that I think has really changed uh, or is changing, and definitely we're not where we need to be, we're getting, I think we're getting better at, is to try to contextualize the words of Jesus in a way that is relevant for the cultures that we are coming in contact with. And I think that's what it means to go out. Um, where you have this idea that the gospel isn't uh, written in English. Uh, it's written in whatever language it needs to be written in yes, for people to understand. And so um, the fact that, for example, uh, this, this ministry is committed to having LOBN Arabic or LOBN Latino in ways, it just shows this, this desire to contextualize the gospel in ways that are relevant. And that's really what Jesus is trying to do throughout the, the gospel of Luke. He's trying to contextualize the message in ways that are relevant to his audience. And we had, oh. No, go ahead, please. No. Talk I'd like to throw a question to our pastors and maybe you folks as well, Sheila and Marlon. We, a lot of us, we understand what is going out sharing the good news. It doesn't mean. But for someone who's listening, who's faithful, but haven't figured out how is it that you share the light in the world? Mm. You know, what, what do you do? You talk about it? You live it? Demonstrate it? You stand on a sidewalk and talk about it? What, what comes to mind that you can give to our viewers an idea like, hey, this is how, this is how simple it is. What would that come to mind from any of you here that we can share with our viewers to help us all grow together? I would say it's simple, but it's not simplistic, yeah. you see. And the other night they mentioned about God's throne, Jesus' throne. Where's the Holy Spirit's throne? Mm. Your heart, your heart, your heart, my heart. That's the throne of the Holy Spirit, making the gospel beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference because we can articulate it, but it's a theory. And that theory has presuppositions to it, mm -hmm. is what I heard as a kid. Now, don't be offended by this, but Mary did not send Jesus to the church school, pardon me, the synagogue schools. Mm -hmm. She homeschooled him. And that's why they were so amazed when he went. Where is he coming from? Is the woman, like you said in Matthew, 
the emphasis, lots of quotes in Matthew from Old Testament. But even then, in that, rather than old, I call it the First Testament, Elijah and Elisha, the woman, food ran out, Gentile. The miracles that happened, a place to stay, Gentile. Those first five books, Torah, Talmud, had the sixth one. That is Isaiah. The word became what? Flesh. Flesh. Let's see Jesus in your life and my life. Not just the theory of it. Mm -hmm. but the, and that's what Je that made impact. And you look at the pre-adolescence of Jesus and what he meant. And then watching him grow, bar mitzvah. My dad was raised by Jewish people. He spoke Yiddish fluently. Mm. We would hear them say the little swatzika. You don't know what it means, but those who. But, and when my dad, they would run in, cry, and they would come back. We're so sorry. That was like using the N-word. Mm -hmm. But my dad understood it, you see. So culture is so important. Songs. Their meaning. So cross the bridge. Crossing the bridge for some may be a creek. Crossing the bridge for others may be a river. Crossing the bridge for others may be an ocean. So foreign mission is when any life is foreign to the mission of God. That's foreign missions. West San Bernardino watched in LA. He started in Los Angeles. Foreign missions. Mm -hmm. Reaching them where they're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just about all the time, out of time, uh, Gannon. Last word. Well, again, I, I, I thank our pastors. Amen. I thank our colleagues, uh, Sheila and Marlon, and all our volunteers and crew members for helping us put together another episode for you. Hope this program has blessed you and blessed you richly. Maybe you can bless someone else by just pointing them to our channel and to some of our programming. Have them watch the repeat of what Pastor Miguel presented here on this program. Jesus is the light, and we thank him for shining that light on us. Mm. Mom. Thank you, Gannon. Amen. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Christian Connections. We'll see you next time uh, on the replay here at LLBN.